you. It's really great to see all of you here. Um, we're after this talk, we're going to take a short break, um, and I'm looking forward to hopefully getting to talk to a lot, a lot of you at that point. Um, I've also been specially asked to announce that there are donuts in the corner, and so please help us out um, eating those. Um, so if you've been following uh, the progress of deep learning in the past couple of years, you've probably noticed that um, language generation has gotten much, much better, noticeably better in the last couple of years. Uh, but as a classical pianist, I wondered, can we take the same progress? Can we apply it instead to music generation? Um, OK, I'm not Mira. Sorry. <laughs> um, hang on. Uh, one moment. I think we're on the wrong slide deck. All right, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, trying again, uh, talking about music generation. Uh, so you can imagine different ways of, uh, of generating music. Um, and one way might be to do um, a, a programmatic approach where you say like, okay, I know that drums are gonna be a certain pattern. Um, harmonies usually follow a certain pattern. You, you can imagine writing rules like that. Uh, but there's whole areas of music that you wouldn't be able to capture with that. There's a lot of creativity, a lot of nuance, the sort of things that you really want a neural net to be able to capture. Um, so I thought I would dive right in by playing a few examples of, of MuseNet, which is this neural net that's been trained on this problem of music generation. So this first one is MuseNet trying to imitate Beethoven and a violin piano sonata. It goes on for a while, but I'll cut it off there. Um, what I'm really trying to go with for uh, in this generation process is trying to get long-term structure, so both the nuance and the, and the um, intricacies of the pieces, but also something that stays coherent over a long period of time. Uh, this is the same model, but instead trying to imitate jazz. And I'll cut this one off too. Um, um, so as you maybe could tell from those samples, I'm more interested in the in the problem of composing the pieces themselves. So sort of how the notes, where the notes should be, and less in the actual quality of the sound, less than the timbre. So I've been using a format that's called MIDI, which is an event-based um, system of writing down music. So it's it's a lot like how you would write down notes in a music score. You know, like this note turns on at this moment in time played by this instrument, maybe at this volume, but you don't know like this amazing cellist actually made it sound this way. So I'm throwing out all of that kind of information. Um, but the advantage of throwing that out is then you can get this longer term structure. Uh, and to build this sort of data set, it involves a little bit of begging for data. I had a bunch of people uh, like BitMIDI and Classical Archives were nice enough to just send me their collections and then a little bit of um, scraping uh, and also Maestro's um, Google Magenta's um, data set and then also a bunch of um, scraping online sets. So the architecture itself, um, here I'm drawing really heavily from the way we do language modeling um, and so we use a specific kind of neural net that's called a transformer architecture um, and the advantage of this architecture is that it's specifically good at doing long-term structure. So you're able to um, look back not only at things that have happened in the recent past, but really you could look back like what happened in the music a minute ago or something like that, which is um, not possible with most other architectures. Um, so in the language world, I like to think of this, uh, the model itself is trained on the task of what word is going to come next. So it might initially see just like question marks. So it knows it's supposed to start something. So you know, in English we know like maybe it's the or she or how or something like that. There are some good guesses and then there's some like really bad guesses. Um, if we know now the first word is hello, then we've kind of narrowed down what we expect our next guesses should be. Um, you know, it, it might be how, it might be my, it's probably not going to be cat. Maybe it could be cat, <laughs> I don't know. Um, at this point, we're getting pretty sure, like a trained model should actually be pretty sure that, you know, there should be a good 90% chance the next word is name. And now it should be like really 100% sure or like 99.5% sure or whatever uh, that the next word is gonna be is. And then here we hit kind of an interesting branching point where there are tons of good answers. So 
Lots of names could be great answers here. Lots of things could also be really bad answers. So we don't expect to see like some random verb, some random, you know, there are lots of things that we, we think would be bad choices, but we get a, a point here to branch in good directions. And so the idea is once you have a model that's really good at this, you can then turn it into a generator by sampling from the model according to those probabilities. So the nice thing is you get the kind of coherent structure, like when you get a moment like this, you know, like I have to choose, in music it's usually like I have to choose this rhythm, I have to choose, like, you know, if I choose a wrong note, it's just gonna sound bad, things like that. But then there are also a lot of points like this where the music can just kind of go in fun and in interesting different directions. But of course, now we have the problem of like, how do you translate words? Uh, how do you translate this kind of music into a sequence of words that the model can do? So the system that I've, um, I'm using is very similar to how MIDI itself works. So I have a series of tokens that the model will always see. So initially it'll always see the composer or the band or whoever wrote the piece. It'll always see what instrument to expect in the piece or what set of instruments. Um, here it sees a start token because it's at the start of, of this particular piece and a tempo. Then as the piece begins, um, it's, we have a symbol that this C and that C each turn on with a certain volume. And then we have a token that says to wait a certain amount of time. And then as it moves forward, the volume zero means that first note just turned off. Um, and the G means the next note turns on. And then again, we have to wait. And similarly here, the G turns off, the E turns on, and we wait. Um, so you can just kind of progress through the whole set of music like this. In addition to this kind of like token by token thing, I'm helping the model out a little bit by giving it a sense of the time that's going on. So I'm also giving it an extra embedding that says everything that happens in this purple line happens in the same amount of time or at the same moment in time. Everything in blue is gonna get a different embedding that's a little bit forward in time and so forth. And the nice thing about an embedding or a, a system like this is that it's, it's pretty dense but also really expressive. Like this is, the first page of a Chopin ballade that is like actually encapsulates how the pianist played it, the volumes, the nuances, the timings, everything like that. So the, the model is gonna see that sequence uh, of numbers like that. So like that first one, four, 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 I think means it must mean Chopin. And the next one probably means piano and the next one means start, that sort of thing. Um, and what the model, the first layer of the model, what it has to do is it needs to translate that number into a vector of numbers and then it can sort of learn a good vector that'll represent, um, so it'll get a sense of like, this is what it means to be Chopin, or this is what it means to be like a C on a piano. And the nice thing you can do once, uh, so the model will learn, like initially it starts out with a totally random sense, so it has no idea what those numbers should be. But in the course of training, it'll learn better, better uh, versions of that. And what you can do is you can start to map out um, what it's learned for these embeddings. So for example, this is what it's learned for a piano scale, like all the notes on a piano. And it's come to learn that like all of these A's are kind of similar, that the, the notes kind of relate to each other. This is like moving up on a piano. It's even, it's hard to tell here, but it's learned little nuances like up a major third is closer than like up a tritone or stuff like that. Like actually really interesting musical stuff. Um, and along with the same thing, um, given the fact that I'm always giving it this genre token and then the instrument token, you can look at uh, the sort of embeddings it's learned for the genres itself. So here, the embedding it's learned for all these French composers ends up being pretty similar. I actually like that Ravel wrote like in the style of Spanish pieces and then there's this Spanish composer that's connected to him. So like it makes a lot of good sense musically. And, uh, and similarly, like over in the jazz domain, a lot of the ones, um, I think there were a couple of random ones that made no sense at all. I can't remember now off the top of my head, but it was like Lady Gaga was connected to Wagner or something like that. <laughs> but um, mostly it made a lot of great sense. Uh, the other kind of fun thing you can do once you have these style tokens is you can try mismatching them. So you can try things like literally taking 0.5 of the embedding for Mozart plus 0.5 of the embedding of jazz and just like adding them together and seeing what happens. Or in this case, what I'm doing is I'm uh, giving it the token for Bon Jovi and the instruments for a band, um, but then I'm giving it the first six notes of a Chopin nocturne. 
and uh, and then the model just has to generate as best it can at that point. Um, and so you'll hear at the start of this, it's um, it's very much how the Chopin Nocturne itself sounds. I've cut off the very, very beginning of it, um, but you'll hear so that left-hand pattern is going to be like straight out of Chopin, and then, uh, uh, well, you'll see what happens. <laughs> Sorry, it's so soft, but it gets very Bon Jovi at this point. Um, the band kicks in. <laughs> I always love it. Like Chopin looks a little shocked, um, but I really love that uh, it manages to keep the the left hand pattern of the nocturne going, even though it's like now thinks it's in this um, in this pop sort of style. Um, so the other thing I've been interested in this project is um, in how musicians and and everyone can use um, generators like this. Um, so if you go to our open a blog you can actually play with the model itself um, we've created um, along with Justin Eric and Nick um, a, a sort of prototype tool of how you how you might uh, co-compose pieces using this model so what you can do is you can specify the style and the instruments um, kind of how long a segment you want the model to generate and you hit start and the model will come back with four different suggestions of like how you might begin a piece in this style and you go through and you pick your favorite one um, you hit the arrow again to keep generating, and the model uh, will come up with four new different ways. Um, and you can kind of continue on this way as long as you want. And what I find kind of fun about this is you're you're actually really, um, like it feels like I'm composing, but not at a note by note level. And so I'm really interested in how um, how humans will be able to, and musicians will be able to um, kind of guide, guide composing this way. And um, just kind of wrapping up, I thought I would uh, play an example of this is one guy who took both GPT-2 to write the lyrics, which I guess is hence the covered in cold feet, and then, uh, <laughs> and then Musenet to do the music. So I'll just, it's a full song, but I'll just play the, the beginning of it that uh, he then recorded himself. Covered in cold feet again, I just want to go home to my friend. Taking a wrong turn again, I am stuck in town, I've got to bend. Is it, uh, is it his page to, uh, to hear the whole song? Um, but it's been really fun to see uh, both those sort of versions. I actually, I mean, the song I ended up singing it the entire day. It gets really catchy. But um, <laughs> um, but uh, it's been really fun to see musicians start to use it. Uh, people have used it to um, kind of finish composing symphonies or uh, to uh, you know write full pieces, um, that sort of thing. And in closing, I just wanted to share. Um, I've kind of gone through this crazy path of two years ago being a classical pianist to um, now doing AI research here. And I just wanted to, I didn't know that Rachel was going to be right here, but I wanted to give a shout out to, uh, to Fast AI. She's the Fast AI celebrity here. Um, but um, uh, yeah, and sort of this has been my path in doing it. Um, I, these are the two courses I particularly love, Fast AI and Deep Learning AI. And then I also went through um, OpenAI's Scholars Program and then the Fellows Program, and now I'm working here full time. But happy to talk to anybody here um, if they're interested in, in this sort of thing. Um, the kind of fun thing about AI is that there's so much that's still wide open, and it's really helpful to come from kind of like different backgrounds where you bring a, it's like kind of amazing how, you know, if you bring a, a new perspective or a new sort of insight, there are a lot of things that are still just wide open that you can figure out how to do. So I encourage anyone to, uh, to come check it out. So. Ah, we'll have a concert. Thank you.